standard setup. Uh, oh, sorry, I did four. I said four nine and four ten, but I meant four eight and four nine. Yeah, no, 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 there is a four ten. No. So the last two sections. So Newton's method antiderivatives, and then chapter five. Okay, so what we learned on Monday uh, was this fundamental theorem of calculus. Right? And to summarize what the fundamental theorem of calculus is really saying, is it's saying that this function g of x has what relation to the function f? What's the relationship of g of x to f? g of x is the antiderivative of f. That's actually what the fundamental theorem of calculus um, is saying. g of x is the antiderivative of f of x. And we use f of t here to not mix up the variables, but it's the same relationship, right? So this is really the, the key relationship, right? And because of that relationship, that's what gives us the part one and part two of the fundamental theorem of calculus, right? That we can find the derivative of this function because we know it's an antiderivative. We can also, in part two, evaluate those definite integrals, right? So part one, part one tells us that g prime of x is equal to f of x, which is exactly the same statement, but just thinking about it as actually taking the derivative of it rather than the antiderivative. And part two is how we evaluate definite integrals. Capital F of B minus capital F of A. So this is really the, the fundamental theorem of calculus. These are the results that we want, and this is really the statement of it that we need to remember. Um, and this g of x that's sort of underlying all of this is that area function, that accumulation function we've done some work with. Okay. Um, and for all of these, what's the, the kind of one requirement that we have on f? If it's continuous, on it's, both intervals. It's got to be continuous. So if f is not continuous, then this fundamental theorem doesn't apply. We can still actually evaluate areas potentially, or definite integrals potentially, but we can't use the fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay. So, um, for example, if you had a function that looked like this, it turns out that definite integral is, is well defined from A to B. <coughs> even though there's this continuity there. The fundamental theorem of calculus will not work because it's not continuous, but it's the area under the curve, which is just going to be these two rectangles, right? Whatever this one is, um, A plus B, right? Add those together. That is the value of the definite integral. So, you know, the definite integral is, is, is sort of its own thing. The fundamental theorem of calculus gives us a tool for working with that definite integral, um, but it's not the only way of thinking of the definite integral. Right? And I had you on the quiz, we did the two other ways of doing the definite integral. Right? One of those is using the definition, the first one on the back page, and the other one is using geometry, which is the second one. So um, those are the three ways that I want you to be able to approach the definite integral. Area, geometry, definition, and fundamental theorem of calculus. All right. Um, now, as we mentioned on <coughs> Monday, actually doing this fundamental theorem of calculus, there's really only one part of it that is challenging. And what is that? What's the hard part of doing this, potentially? It's finding the antiderivative, right? As long as you can find what capital F is, it's just evaluating it of these two numbers, right? And it gives you, spits out a number, right? So the only sort of 
calculus or challenging part is finding those antiderivatives. And so that's really what we're working with in 5.4 and especially 5.5 is focusing on finding the antiderivatives because that's the, the crux of this problem. So 5.4 is introducing something called the indefinite integral. And um, the indefinite integral looks like this. So it's our same integral symbol. We just don't have bounds. We don't have an upper and a lower bound. And it has a very different meaning. Um, all this is asking you for is the antiderivative. of your function, whatever it is. So all that all the indefinite integral is, is it's just a, a symbol, a notation, a way of writing antiderivative. Just like we have f prime that tells us derivative, it's nice to have some symbol that tells us we want to take the antiderivative, and that's what this indefinite integral is. So realistically, this we could have introduced this back in 4.9 when we did antiderivatives. And we could have just said, this is the symbol we're using for antiderivatives. And you would have said, OK, whatever. Right. Now, because we introduce it now, we have a little bit more sense of why we use this symbol. Um, it's very much related to this, right? This is the summation, infinite summation tool. And the fundamental theorem shows us that that is related to the antiderivative but you don't actually need to know any of that to do these problems, right? All this is asking for is the antiderivative, the antiderivative of x cubed plus 3, x squared over 2, plus 3x, plus c. So notice the answer here is, is fundamentally a totally different thing than the answer is here, right? This answer is a number which represents some kind of signed area, right? Positive or negative areas added all together. This answer is a function, right? And in fact, not even one function, but a whole class of functions. Right? So even though the symbols are related, the results are, are totally different. So it's just asking you for antiderivatives. The reason we do that, of course, is because that's the critical part of this process, right? It's being able to find these antiderivatives. Um, so if you look in, in your book in 5.4, um, they give you a whole list of these, a table of indefinite integrals. It's on page 403. We, we covered a number of these when we looked at um, antiderivatives. I don't think there's actually anything new in there. Um, but they're just written in terms of this indefinite integral notation. So, for example, the antiderivative of secant tangent is secant, right? So it's just it's sort of clearing out some of the cobwebs, maybe, right, from derivatives. Um, remember, it's this because the derivative of secant is. So that's all those rules are, is they're basically <coughs> derivative rules just written in reverse, right? The derivative of secant is secant tangent. The antiderivative of secant tangent is secant. So if you look at that list, all of those functions should be um, familiar to you from your derivative rules. Um, at the bottom, they use the, the hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine. We won't see those. You don't have to worry about those. Um, and actually, if you look, I mean, if you want to do more looking, um, if you look in the back, there's um, there's lists here that derivative rules, keep going, and then they have tables of integrals. So there are uh, they list 120 different varieties of indefinite integral. 
find a book. If you went to a mathematics library, you could find a book probably as thick as this, full of tables of indefinite integrals. Um, because finding them is not always easy, right? These are antiderivatives. Um, they're, they can be hard to find. So our goal here is just to give us a kind of um, a grounding in what we are looking, some strategies for, for finding antiderivatives. As I mentioned before, if you go to Calc 2, you will learn more techniques, but you will never become perfect right, in the way that we are perfect with derivatives. Right? You can find the derivative of any elementary function. It's not possible with antiderivatives. Um, so let's talk briefly here about strategy for indefinite intervals. Which, just another way of saying antiderivatives, right? It's a strategy for antiderivatives. Um, so the first thing is, is the integrand, that's just the part in here. Right, the function that you're applying the integral to. Is the integrand a derivative of a known function? That would be this situation. Right? This is the integrand secant tangent. That is the derivative of a function we know secant, so you can find that antiderivative directly. find the antiderivative directly. Those are the easiest ones, but you've got to recognize them, right? I mean, if you don't see that, then this turns into kind of a hard problem. Um, so you've got to be familiar with some of those standard antiderivatives. One we have mentioned before is 1 over 1 plus x squared. That's arctan. So if you can recognize, oh, that is the derivative of a known function, then we can find that antiderivative directly. So that's sort of the first, maybe your most optimistic strategy. If not, we're going to try to rewrite using algebra, trig, etc. Um, for example, the antiderivative of um, uh, cosine x over sine squared. You would look at that and you would say, okay, is there some function whose derivative is cosine over sine squared? Not that we know. Right? I mean, none of our basic functions have a derivative that seems to look like that. So we move on and we say, is there some way that I can rewrite this using trig to make this problem look better? not always obvious necessarily what that rewriting might do, but if you look at it like this, cosine over sine, cotangent, 1 over sine, cosecant, remember the antiderivative of cotangent, cosecant, cosecant, cotangent. This is the derivative of cosecant x with 
plus. So by doing a little rewriting, we were able to turn it into something that, if we were lucky, right, we would recognize as a known derivative. Um, I guess some, some strategies here are to, if you can break up into sums, that's certainly an improvement, right? If you can have a product but somehow rewrite that or break that up into a sum, that's going to help out. We want to avoid products and quotients. We don't know how to deal with those, so we want to try and rewrite so we don't have those. In, in 5.4, that's kind of it. That's our only other strategy. So the, the antiderivatives that you'll see in 5.4, if they're not a direct antiderivative, you're going to just do some algebra, and they'll, they'll rewrite in a way that they will be a direct derivative. Um, but to prep us for 5.5, um, if we can't rewrite it in some effective way, <coughs> what we're going to use is a technique called substitution. Substitution is a strategy to um, undo the chain rule. And this is what we'll learn in 5.5. So this is sort of the, the template that you want to work through when you see an antiderivative. Just like when you do factoring, right, you have a structure for factoring. Right? You pull out the greatest common factor, and then you, you figure out if it's two terms or three terms, and you, you know, some different strategies. Same idea, right? You see a lot of antiderivatives, we need a strategy. This is the way to, to kind of work through that strategy. Um, another one. Look at the antiderivative of x squared plus 3 times 2x plus 1. So it's, there's no function whose derivative looks quite like that. Right? So what do you do? Yeah, you, you multiply it out, and, and that's because you're thinking, well, if I multiply it out, then I'm avoiding a product. I'm turning that into sums. So that's going to be an easier problem for me to find the antiderivative of. 2x cubed plus x squared plus 6x plus 1. Right, when you multiply it all out, that's certainly a big improvement. Question? No, I was just going to say that plus 3. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Actually, doing the multiplication. Thank you. Um, that's important. Right? As always, we know algebra sometimes bites us, right? Um, so this now I can take the antiderivative of each piece separately. Each of these are just a power rule. Two x to the fourth over four. X cubed over three. Six x squared over two and a 3x and a c. We simplify that a little bit. x to the fourth over 2, x cubed over 3. So x squared plus c. So there's a number of different variations on that, but I think you'll find that they're, they're relatively straightforward in this, um, at this level. Um, it's mostly, I think, about getting a feel of what's better, right? It's important that when you see this, that you understand that this is not good because this is a product of two things. Right? We don't know how to work with this. And this is a big improvement because each of these can be dealt with separately, right? So if you have that kind of intuition of, well, this is going to be better, you'll do well in this section. Right? What kind of um, things you can deal with and 
the second part of this chapter deals with something called the net change theorem. And it's getting at what this um, definite integral is really telling us about a function. So when you see a definite integral, what do you think of that as? Area. Area, right? That's how we generated it. That's how we talked about it. That's how we think of our definition. We really think of this as area, I'll put it in quotes because it might be positive or negative, right? But area under f of x. But there's a different way to think of that definite integral. Rather than thinking of f of x as, as or the integrand as some arbitrary function, let's think of it instead as the derivative of some function. They're just functions, so whether I call it the derivative or the original function is, is not really important, except that this changes the way I think about the result. Um, so what the net change theorem says is that if I integrate the derivative of some function, this is going to equal the net change in the original function. from B to A. So the net change is, is um, kind of how much the function um, changes at the end compared to where it started. And there's no actual, it's sort of obvious actually if you remember your fundamental theorem of calculus, right? Because the fundamental theorem of calculus says that the value of this is going to be <coughs> the antiderivative here, which is f, right? The antiderivative of f prime is f. So by the fundamental theorem, this is exactly f of b minus f of a, which is exactly what the net change is. Um, so here's, here's an example of what that's telling us in more concrete terms. If the velocity of a particle is given by, uh, let's say, v of t equals um, four minus t squared. find the net change in position from t equals 0 to t equals 3. So I know the velocity function, and I'm interested in how far does the particle move, basically, right? What's the net change in its position? So this is this net change theorem. The net change in the derivative, so the net change in a function is the definite integral of its derivative. So if I integrate the velocity function that's going to tell me the net change of position. Do you see that how that calculation works? This is going to effectively be evaluating the antiderivative. The antiderivative of velocity is position, right? So it's going to tell me what's the position of my particle at 3 and subtract from that the position of my particle at 0, right, where it starts. So it's going to give me the net change in position. Now, I don't actually know what the position of the particle is because if I were to find the antiderivative, I would have a plus c, right? If you only know how fast the particle is moving, you don't actually know where it is. But 
the net change because I subtract where it starts, the plus C gets canceled out. It doesn't actually matter exactly where it is if I'm looking at the net change, right? Like where I started minus where I finished, right? If it starts up here, it's going to finish up here. If it starts down here, it's going to finish the same relationship, right? Plus C's are the same. So this is just a calculation. Fundamental theorem of calculus, I find the antiderivative of that minus the antiderivative of that. And I evaluate it from 0 to 3. Remember, that's the notation we use. I put in the 3. 12 minus 27 over 3. And then I subtract the 0. When I put in 0, it's 0. That's the cap that's the function evaluated 3 minus the function evaluated at 0. 12 minus 9. kind of a new development here because the we thought of the definite integral as just being area. Area, 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 right? That's fine. But we don't care all that much about area. I don't know, unless you're like into sheet metal or dressmaking or something, right? Like the area is, is limited. But it's more than area, right? What it's actually giving us is the change in the antiderivative, right? So if you're working with a rate of change, a velocity, how fast water's coming out of some spigot, what's the population change, what's your marginal cost, your change in cost over manufacturing, the definite integral is then giving us the net change in that original quantity. What's the net change in the population? It's the net change in the water flow, right? If I know something about the rate of change, this definite integral is telling me about how the function is changing. So area is not just a geometric thing, it's actually a relationship or showing me about the change in the function. So this is my velocity function from that problem there. And when I integrated that from 0 to 3, it turns out when it's 3, it's down here. What that did is it added up all of these quantities. And when it added up these positive values and these negative values, got to 3. So that's the net change in position of this particle. Now that's different than how far the particle actually moved. Right? Because what this is saying is that when t equals 0, if I'm the particle, and this is the positive direction, when t equals 0, my velocity was positive. So I started here, let's say. I moved over when t equals 2, all of a sudden my velocity was negative. And then when t equals 3, I was here. So the net change in position is from where I started, where I finished, compared to where I started. Right? That's 3. But the actual distance traveled is larger than that, right? Because I went forward some and then back a little bit. So. distance traveled is not equal to the net change, right? That's a different That's a different quantity. Because the net change is taking this positive and this negative and they cancel out a little bit and I end up with 3. The actual distance traveled would be all of this plus all of this, right? So, how could we calculate that? Um, you know, yeah, zero uh, plus 
positive? Yeah, I, I really want to make this negative value positive. So instead of canceling off some of this, it's, it's adding back into it. So the way to do that is to notice that it switches at 2. That's just because of this function, right? At 2 at 0. So I can integrate from 0 to 2. <coughs> That's going to give me this positive area. And then I can add to that this, right? Like I said, I want to make this negative positive. So I'm going to integrate from 2 to 3. I can do it either way. Either I can just integrate it, that's going to give me a negative value. I can change that to positive after the fact. Or I can say, well, I know it's going to be negative, so let's, let's make opposite right now. Effectively, this is actually the same as like your substitution for the absolute value of x, right? If it's positive, you leave it. If you know it's negative, you put a negative in front of it to make it positive, right? That's what this is doing. So I add these two together, that will give me the total distance traveled. T minus T cubed over 3 from 0 to 2 is going to be 8 minus 8 thirds minus 0. And minus 4T plus T cubed over 3 from 2 to 3. Minus 12 plus 27 thirds minus negative 8 plus 8 thirds. So you, you can see just from this little operation, you've got to be careful with your positives and your negatives, right? I've got a sum here, I'm subtracting that. The safest thing is just to make sure you use parentheses when you, right, this is your f of 3, this is your f of 2. So use parentheses, take your time with those, with those parts. So what is this? 24 thirds minus 8 thirds, 16 thirds. This is going to be minus 36 plus 27. Well, plus plus 9, right? Minus 12 plus 9 is minus 3. Minus 24 thirds plus 8 thirds is minus 16 thirds. Minus 9 thirds plus 16 thirds equals 7 thirds. Those are the actual areas. So the total distance traveled is 16 thirds plus 7 thirds. <coughs> so the point of this is to, is to make sure you understand the difference between net change and <coughs> distance traveled. Right, the net is just where you end up minus where you started. That's your net. You may have gone up and back and up and back throughout that time, right? Way back down and way back up, but the net is just where you end minus where you started. And that makes sense because that's exactly what the definite integral is, is telling you, right? It's it's the antiderivative at the end point minus the antiderivative at the beginning point. That's your net change in whatever that function is. Velocity is the easiest because we know the relationship between velocity and position. But you can do it for any derivative. Questions about that? This is a fairly typical kind of problem. I'll give you some velocity function and say what's the net change in position and what's the total distance traveled. So to find total distance, you kind of need a little graph or you need to know where to break it up and do it in two parts. 
testing whether you understand that the definite integral is sort of adding these negative numbers and the positive numbers together. That's your net. And we've done that before, right? That's our net area. We've talked about that in terms of area as well. Um, You know, do you, I don't know, do you believe this? Right, I mean, this is, saying the antiderivative of the velocity function is your position function. Now, it's real rough here because we have some starting values and plus c stuff to worry about. But, but effectively, this is, this is true, right? Um, yeah. You want to include dx there? Oh, well, uh, I want to include a dt there. dt is part of that integral symbol. Think of the dt or the dx as kind of just Describing what the variable is within your your antiderivative, so it is good to have that. Um, another way to think of this is if I were to estimate the position, estimate the distance traveled. If I wanted to estimate the distance traveled over, say, this first second. I might say, well, what's the velocity at the end of that time period? Let's say this velocity is 2 feet per second, right here. So over one second, I could estimate the distance traveled by taking the velocity times the time. Velocity times time would give me position, so it would give me 2 feet, and that's this area inside. So that's like an estimate of the area, but we know the exact area is the, is the definite integral. So area is more than just physical area, right? It's really telling me how much the antiderivative is changing of your original function. Okay. <coughs> um, Let We've had these graphing type problems all through the course, so we can look at another variation of these. <coughs> 
first make sure you understand the relationship. The function that's being shown there is f. But the questions are asking you about g, which is this accumulation function. So we've done that in the past. We actually <coughs> graph the derivative and asked you questions about f. You got to keep straight what the picture is and what the function is. So what is g of 0? Zero. You don't even need the picture for that, right? G of zero is the integral from zero to zero, so that's zero. What is G of one? Zero. Negative one half. Negative one half. G of one is the area from zero to one of this function, right? This function negative over that region, and it's a little triangle there, which is one half. What is g of four? It's two. Two, right? The easiest way to see that is this minus one half and this plus one half are going to cancel, and then I'm going to get these two squares. So that's what the area function is, right? And you could do that for different values. Um, you, could, you could estimate that if you had curves. You can find that. So it's step one. Step two is to talk about the derivative of g. What is g prime of 2? The original function evaluated at 2. Which is? f of 2, right? The derivative of g is f. So this is f of 2, f of 2. My picture isn't great, but it's just going to say 1. A little assistance, right? A little bendy curve. Maybe. Yeah, that's what so the key thing here is to understand that relationship. The derivative of g is f. So g of x has a relative, uh, I don't think that's a bad question, it's a maximum, um, I should say relative minimum. We'll start with relative minimum. Uh, one. Why? Because the derivative of g is f. So the derivative of g is 0, which means that's a critical point. Right? If the derivative is 0, that's a critical point. And the derivative goes from negative values to positive values. So that's going to be a relative minimum in x equal 1. So the maximum, relative maximum, yeah, there's no other critical points. There's no other spot where the, the function, the derivative, is zero or undefined, so it does not exist. That was unintentional. I didn't mean to picture that. And you can see it in terms of area, right? As you move from here to here to here to here to here, the x values change. You're gathering more and more negative area, right? So the function g is getting lower and lower and lower and lower, all the way down to one half, negative one half, right? And then as you move on this side of 1, the function starts adding area back to it, right? And it gets all the way up here. The function g is 0 at this point. So that point there gives a minimum to that function g. g is a gathering up area. So I can ask you lots of questions about f and g and their relationships. They all come back to understanding that the derivative of g is f. So if I ask you a question that requires you to know the derivative of g, you know it. This is the derivative. It's actually a very parallel question to if I change the names from f and g, I could have called this f prime of t, and I could have called this f. The relationship here between these green functions is the same as the relationship 
this is the derivative of that in the same way that f is the derivative of the area function. So that's the relationship that is established by the fundamental theorem. Okay. Um, so I'll let you go. Um, keep working on these sections, as you know from past experience, right, as we get down to like a week before the test, there's less time to catch up, right, so you need to stay on top of things, so if there are some problems, you can get those fixed before the test. Um, we'll be covering our last section on Friday, 5.5, we'll go over the quizzes then, I'll post the key to the quiz later today, as well as that review assignment. I realize we am able to get them done just before our next product rule, right? Uh, I added it by accident when you spoke to multiply it. Yeah. yeah, I thought about changing these ones. I was like, you're supposed to put it back up here somehow. You also, I want to ask, the antiderivative of this, it's one more, the one plus x. X to the fifth over Yeah. 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 And it's like one fourth. Yeah. Because I was like, yeah.